particular about how money changes over time. And so one thing that should become apparent to you is that investing really early is something that's important. Because this money is going to grow on a compound basis and to your benefit. So if, if um, I started investing maybe only about four or five years after leaving uh, undergraduates, and those last three or four years of opportunity add up to quite quite a bit of um, money. So the earlier you start, the, the better it is. And uh, we're going to look at a bit about how that comes about. So. Today's class is, is purely from the notes, the slides, and um, I'm going to be following Dr. Marlin's material very closely, at least for the next few weeks, and then after that we'll see the next video that I've done. We're going to look here at the general study of economics, particularly the time value of money, and then a few other details related to engineering investments. But here's uh, one particular definition of what economics is, and it's probably the most common definition is, is looking at the allocation of scarce resources um, when you have alternative options. So by scarce here we mean resources that are not freely available in almost infinite quantities. So something that is not scarce would be seawater. Seawater is available to us in pretty much infinite quantities. The air that we breathe, not necessarily the clean air, but air in general is available to us in those are not really scarce resources. Okay. So what we're looking at here is, is resources that are readily just in limited quantities. So a classic example of that would be something like gold or diamonds. These are two materials that are exist in a natural state. Gold in particular is kind of created in very, very limited quantities because there's a, a set number of tons of gold that are available to us in the earth and the price of gold fluctuates depending on how easily and capable mines are able to extract those gold bodies and then sell it. So the market is, is willing to pay a certain price for it and these companies are willing to accept a certain amount of risk sending people under the ground to dig it out in, in a ratio that's about Five to eight grams per ton. So every ton of gold they bring out, they're bringing out about eight grams of gold. Okay. What's the price of gold roughly these days? Seventeen hundred. Per ounce. An ounce is about, I think it's thirty-five grams. If you look at, or like maybe twenty-one or thirty-five. One of those two numbers. So this company has to extract a significant volume of ore and then separate out that ore to get to the gold. So there's a price set by how easily they're able to uh, And then in South Africa recently where there were strikes in the gold mines, the price of gold adjusted based on that. Because <coughs> it's now highly demanded. So we're looking at where we've got these scarce resources, how are we going to allocate our money? We've got options to choose where we're going to allocate our money. When things are scarce, where are we going to allocate those? So in, in your in the four W course, there's this uh, where you'll be looking at, at alternative investments and alternative options in the, in the classic design sense. We'll be using these tools from this course to come up with an evaluation of the alternatives. In this course, we'll be looking at things like plastic or chemical processes and how we go about that. And we'll be looking at how we interpret those judgments of profitability. So we will we'll learn a little bit now about how to come up with a profitability estimate and how we read those numbers. So what you'll we'll, what we'll tend to find in most companies is, especially the larger companies, is that they don't leave the engineers to make the decisions. Okay? They are done by people from finance and up at the CEO level, or just below that. So those decisions of whether to go ahead and actually make the purchase are made by people who look at those profitability figures. But when I was at Blackstone, I was on a conference call to uh, the UK head office with a senior purchasing manager for the company. And I had to justify why I had chosen a particular tablet inspection sheet. And I had calculated different measures of profitability, taking into account cost savings from employees, potential improvements in throughput because we could now get this drug out the door faster, 
Um, and so all of those me me measures of played in to calculating the profitability metric. I put those numbers into a spreadsheet that was designed by the finance department. They don't trust the engineers to actually do the calculations. In this class, we will learn how those calculations um, work, and we, we will actually calculate the numbers ourselves. But in most good companies, they tend to have a spreadsheet template already set up for you, and that's because engineer A is going to fit, design a spreadsheet one way, engineer B will design a spreadsheet the other way, and so people at the upper level of the company making these financial decisions don't want to see different, different spreadsheets. They want one unified template that they know how to interpret. So that tends to be how it goes, but the engineers are still responsible for putting the numbers into those spreadsheets and then forwarding the appropriate financial decision to the finance department to make, to make an evaluation. So we have to understand firstly how those numbers are calculated. We can't just rely on the spreadsheet templates that do it for us, although we may end up using them. We have to understand how those templates work. And then secondly, we also have to understand how to pick them amongst multiple alternatives. <coughs> Okay, so, so that's where we're heading for, for this next few weeks. And what you can also do, of course, is use this um, information to make investment decisions in your own life. So if you decide to buy a new car or a used car, um, we will do an example in this class on um, whether university education is actually worth it. Okay, so you're in your final year, so it's, it's too late to kind of reverse that decision. But we're going to actually look at the financial implications of your choice to be in university for four or five years versus being in the workforce for four or five years. And you could have been four or five years ahead already in terms of earning money. The same decision takes place when you decide to do a master's degree and forego two years of being in the workforce versus um, staying in university or a PhD, which is an even longer. PhD, by the way, is, is almost never economically viable because those four or five last years of earnings you'll never make up. But you're doing a PhD for other reasons, usually. <laughs> okay, so but university education versus a college education versus deciding to do no post-secondary education, that's, that's the, the number you can easily calculate on yourself, and we will do that in the next day or two. And then finally, obviously, this goes over to corporate financial decisions where so we may not be making those decisions and working with those numbers. We're providing the input, the costing for a new chemical process or an alternative chemical process, and then other people make other purpose. So here's, here's a classic example. If your supervisor comes on the, on the first uh, week when you're starting to work there or whenever, there's this particular distillation column, and it's at its maximum capacity. There's a drive to increase production rate by 35% because there's an increase in the market demand for this product. So an increased demand, we're going to try and meet that supply and, and increase what we are company's productivity and profitability. Multiple options exist. <coughs> Which ones would be the one to go for? Take a look at those and discuss with the person next to you what is involved in each of those decisions? What financial information do you need? And what other implications are there about going through each of those decisions? So just take a minute or two and just quickly go through each of those five options. Talk about what's going to be involved with each one of them. What, what data do you need to make a, a decision in each case? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
website from a PDF from a Cambridge magazine in the 80s that talks about upgrading a power's capacity by adding some packings. I'll post that there. It's quite interesting to read what some of the other implications are. Increase the number of trades, again, downtime, the cost of, of purchasing and installing those trades. Option four is actually extremely common. Right, so this option is very attractive from a company's perspective. There's no capital prices here that they have to, to take into account. They don't have to purchase extra land. There's no increase in utilities on their site. No increased operators, maintenance staff. Okay? The pharmaceutical companies do this all the time. They have the patent on a particular drug, but they outsource the production of the drug to a, a contract company to manufacture it. Food companies do this all the time. There's no main brand food that you purchase in the grocery store. Those are made by the name brand companies, but just packaged in no-name box. Why is it why is the no-name company uh, why is the name brand company willing to do this and undercut their own market? They still get paid for They still make a sale. They'd rather get some money than than no money. So so they, so that that happens a lot outside of contracting. Or you should look at modifying the operating uh, point of the, of the process. So you move to a different operating region, maybe likely will be higher energy cost support. So for each one of these scenarios, you could you could cost out a spreadsheet with over a period of time that it would take to implement that option and take all the costs involved. The income, if you if you get all the all the scenarios on equal footing, you'll you'll get all your scenarios so that you get your 35% production rate increase. So your income should be constant for all five conditions. But your potential expenses and the time involved with that will be different for each one. Okay, now there's another point that you can uh, that not take into account here. And you could you could cost in the risk of that's right, yeah. You 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 need to then now come into the area of taking your risk and coming up with a dollar value and adding that into the scenario. So am I going to put money aside for lawsuits because my quality isn't right? And am I going to put money aside um, to budget for the fact that this parallel distillation tower that's installed by an outside contractor, what if that outside contractor is delayed by six to two months to a year? 
So, and I've got lost, lost production over there. So what we tend to do is we never build one economic scenario. For every one of those cases, you'll build the upside and the downside and then the nominal. You'll probably build three spreadsheets for every one of those and present the optimistic case, the worst case, and then the middle ground case, by taking into account different risks. So that's, that's, a, that's a standard sensitivity analysis we will also cover that later on. Okay, so where we're going over the next few weeks is today we're going to introduce this concept of time value of money, which is something that you're probably all familiar with already. Um, but we'll just uh, introduce some notation and way of thinking about it. Then over the next few classes, we'll look at evaluating possibility of, an op of a particular option. Then we'll learn how to compare options, because there's always a comparison. There's always you do something or you do nothing. So you always have at least two or more scenarios to choose from. So how do we compare alternatives? And then finally, we'll learn how to estimate these costs, because if we're building a new distillation tower, it's not that you can just phone out the company and say, give me a number for a new distillation call. Uh, there's more involved to it than that. So companies will not give you a quote in an hour or a day or time to say a new distillation column will cost you X dollars. Um, but we need that data probably within a day or at least at least a week minimum. So we really have to be able to estimate the costs in a fairly short way, at least with some measure of error. So we're willing to accept a fair degree of error, but at least we, we need that cost to make a decision right now or very soon. Throughout this class there will be some some exercises like we've just had where you stop and discuss. I'd like you to sit with your group members so that you build up that coherence amongst your group. These exercises will also be assignment questions and tutorial questions that make sense as well in your groups. But there will be uh, a midterm on the economic section coming up and then you'll apply the same your project as well in self directed So, the time value of money is a simple money balance. And in this case, it's even simpler than an energy case. We've got money in and money out. We generally don't have money being created or destroyed, unless you're the government. Okay, so, money comes in and money flows out. So, addition and subtraction into a boundary. And that boundary is whatever you pick that's relevant to the, to the case study. So, it's usually project-based. We're deciding we're going to implement a project for a new distillation column. And you look at the potential sources of revenue from these increased sales. And you look at your costs and expenses from operating costs, electricity, maintenance, and raw material costs. So generally, they tend to be project-based um, around a unit operation or around a flow sheet of multiple unit operations. The way we, we like to visualize some of this is to look at cash flow diagram. So if we, if we, if we look back, um, we can, we'll do our numbers in spreadsheets. We'll do our calculations in spreadsheets. But it's always extremely helpful to visualize our results as a cash flow diagram. And we use the following approach. Money comes in and money flows out over, over periods of time. So we, we select a period of time. And each period of time over here, this delta, is what's appropriate to your particular project. If your project is going to happen between now and a year from now, it's appropriate to look at month, monthly time frames. If your project is over a much longer time span, and you're looking at potential revenues and expenses over a 10, 15 year period, then it makes sense to use years of it. If you're buying a house, this will definitely be years if you look at your cash flow incomes and outflows. If you're buying a car, you may look at it in the terms of months. So car, car pricing is all, almost always costed in months for financing. Um, if you're looking at your own situation here in the, in the university, you may have your budget prepared from if you do budgeting from September to September, so there a, a weekly time, I'm uh, sorry, a monthly time frame would be appropriate. So what we'll do is we'll take
take within that period, let's take this, this example of yourself, and you've got your bank statement at the end of the month, you've seen the money come in, the money come out, what you'll do is you'll sum your money in and your money out, and the net result of that you plot on this, on this diagram. So if you had more money come in than out, you're left with some positive cash flow, let go of the money, you're going to have the stick pointing upwards in proportion to the amount of money that you have. If you spend more than you do, then it's a negative cash flow and it will point down. And again, the length of that is in proportion to the amount of bits that you have. And we'll use this convention that we'll start numbering our periods at zero. I'll, I'll illustrate why that is in a, in, a, in a few minutes. This will be period zero. This is right now. So period zero on this cash flow diagram, this is right now. But that particular point in time is also the end of period minus one. So we do go, we, we can work in the past and, and sometimes helpful to, to consider that. That same point is also the start period one. So whatever that, that, that amount of money is, let's say it's a positive inflow, we draw a vertical dot line to indicate that. So that's the money that we have left over at the end of period minus one. It's given by that blue line. Okay. So that, this line that we draw is the net at the end of the previous period. Now, month one continues, so now it's September. And at the end of the month, you, you look at your bank balance, your net, and it's either positive or negative. Let's say it's negative in this case. That's your net expenditure at the end of September. So here, the key assumption is the sum of all cash flow that occurred during the period, but we place that at the end of the period. Now, obviously, you're going to get concerned because this is September, but between the 1st and 31st of September, or how many days of September? 30? 30 days of September, there's going to be multiple inflows and outflows. So we're, we're going to be, it, it doesn't look like a fair diagram. We're ignoring the fact that multiple transactions take place during the month. So there's multiple inflows and outflows. But we're just going to show the net result of it at the end. We're not too concerned with the day-to-day -day um, operations that take place. We're only going to be concerned with the net value at the end of the period. The assumption is that pretty much things are not changing. Time value of money is not changing within a period. But between, between the periods, that money is slowly devaluing over time. Okay, so that's the cash flow diagram that I just showed you over there, is this, is this first one. What we can also do is we can plot the cumulative cash flow. So at, we take our particular time period at at zero, at zero, and then we add the cash flow, the net cash flow at the end of that first period to that, and we draw it over here. And then we see on adding those particular, those, those particular distances to get the cumulative cash flow. What's the advantage of the cumulative cash flow? What interesting information do you get? Can I identify your break even point? Sorry. So where you cross zero over there is where your 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 broken even. But for many economic projects, that time that it takes to break even is an important metric of evaluation. How long is it before we're going to recover our expenses? Our expenses at the front are, 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 are high. Is it going to be months or years before we recover that? So that's that's a helpful. Okay, so take a look at this question here. Think about it for a minute. If someone's asking you, 
to lend a hundred dollars, and they'll pay you back three years later. Or it could even be your parents and you. You're asking them to cover your fees, and that may be, let's say, fifty thousand dollars that you want from your parents now, and you're going to give them back fifty thousand dollars three years from now. Is this a reasonable financial proposition? But let's take a look at it from your, your side, when your friend is asking you. From your perspective, is this a good financial proposition? that money in the future is worth less than it is now. And in the, this is an important point to understand because in Canada we don't see this too much. What's our level of inflation over, over time? It's minor, right? So we, we barely notice the price of, of goods changing over time. But many of you will be working in countries, you might work for a Canadian company who's got a presence in, in South America, for example or in Greece, or in some other countries, where that rate of inflation is much, much higher. So to, to temporarily suspend the, the belief that there's no such thing, or not take it into account at all in your calculations is going to be quite damaging. For example, uh, South Africa, where I'm from, I'm used to banks paying interest in the order of 6 to 7%. Okay, But there, my parents are also used to paying mortgages that are in the order of 18 to 15%. And inflation is in the order of 5 6%. Okay, so that's normal everyday inflation. Okay, so we have to take that into account. So North America has gone through a very unusual st stable period of very low inflation rates. Let's take a look at that right So here's a chart showing inflation over time. So here's uh, what we're interested in is this gray, gray period over here. Inflation cost of living. So here's from the 1950s, and inflation was very nominal. Here we're now in 2010-11, inflation is down at 2%. But look here at this very interesting period in the 70s. This was Canada. People who did pay double digit in, in mortgages on their houses. Okay, so it has happened in your parents' lifetime that you've had high inflation. 
So that's the other thing I also want to emphasize in this chart, is to assume a constant rate of time value of money is something we often do. And it, we've gotten away with it since the 1995 onwards. There's been a reasonable assumption to assume that. But there's no guarantee it's going to stay like that in the future. So that's another thing to consider when you're doing any of your scenarios, is that assuming a 2 5% rate of, of decline in the value of money due to inflation is not always going to be fair. So there may be periods where very slowly, if history repeats itself, here in the 60s we had 2 3 5%. And very quickly it creeps up on us and it st stays at that high rate from 73 to about 83. We had 10 years of double digit inflation. Okay. So it's not, it's not impossible. Uh, inflation has had some dramatic consequences in some countries, for example, Germany in the 1920s. 40, 40 marks was equivalent to one US dollar, but by 1923, it was 40 trillion marks worth a dollar. So the, com the country, in order to pay back its war debts to the England and France, ran their printing presses for 24 hours a day. They had 17, 1,700 printing presses just printing money. They were printing marks to buy foreign currency and pay their debt. They were essentially stealing money from their population, devaluing their own currency in order to pay back their war debt. So, and that's not even the highest inflation rate. So Zimbabwe, two, three years ago, if you Google the Zimbabwe dollar, they had inflation in the trillion percent. So their people would leave work at lunchtime to go buy their dinner, because if they left it to the evening, it would be double or way more than double the price. Okay, so it's not uncommon to see that. Well, that is uncommon, but it's not uncommon to see the double digit so we have to take this time out of money into account. And the way we do this is we quantify it based on the interest rate. We use a rate, it's a multiplicative rate, because we're saying that the decline in our money over time is going to be proportional to how much money we have. So the decline in hundred dollars is going to be minimal in terms of the dollar figure in terms of the, compared to the decline of the million dollars, but the percentage should stay the same. So it's a multiplicative percentage or rate that we use to devalue. So here's some notation that we're going to use in our cash flow diagrams. We're going to call the present value of money, so $100 in today's, in your pocket today, is capital P. What is the future value of that money is going to be capital F when we're given an interest rate I. So I is, if I is a 10% interest, we'll write I as 0 0.1 to represent 10%. So what? And then the number of periods that we're going to consider over our cash flow diagram starting from period 0, we're going to consider lowercase n. Period one, two, three, and four periods of this diagram. And what we're going to do most often, and this is the, one of the ways that's helpful to think about these problems, is we recognize that we're going to get money coming into our company in the future. So we build up our, our let's consider building a process from scratch or adding this distillation column example from scratch. We're going to have a lot of revenue, a lot of capital expenses right now. We're going to pay for those distillation columns. We're going to pay for the installation of them. But the revenue is, up, is going to come over, let's say, a 20-year horizon that we plan to run that distillation column for. So M is 20 years, 20 periods. We've got a lot of expenses right now in period zero, but we're going to get revenue in the future. What we're interested in is to help bring all those revenues in the future back to today to make sure that our revenue in the future, if we consider our total revenue in the future, back calculated in today's dollars, are those revenues going to exceed the expenses we've, we've sunk? That's what we're most interested in. So we'll, we tend to bring 
our future values and calculate our present value from it. So here's, here's something for you to try. Um, given an amount, a dollar amount F, in the future, say $100 in the future, what is its present value at, right now at time zero if we've got an interest rate I, and let's use I of 5% and our period that we considered it is 1. What would, what would be the value right now of that future $100? And, um, let's say someone's going to give me $100 a year from now. What is that money worth to me in today's yeah. Yeah.
looking at asking the following question. So, so this is, uh, let's word this quite back. We were saying, I'm going to receive $1,000 every year at the end of the year in the future. So someone's going to give me $1,000 a year from now. They're going to give me another $1,000 two years from now. What is the present value of those $1,000? over the next 10 years, assuming that the time value of money is declining at 10% per year. <coughs> so we substitute into that formula and then we can um, do this in a, in a simple Excel spreadsheet. <coughs> so we put our present value over here, our interest rate over there, and we consider for every period the declining value. So that $1,000 that I received right at, in this period is worth 1000 then it's worth 909 so by the 10th year, that revenue in present day terms is worth a lot less. So 10 years from now, someone will still give me $1,000, but it's going to be $1,000 in 10 years from now's money. In today's money, that's worth much less. Okay? We need to bring things on equal footing here, and this is why we're we're down way to future money because there's that risk involved and the time value of declining the money is involved there. So we want to bring things on equal footing and compare things in today's monetary terms. And the reason for that is we want to bring it to present value because we're going to be making our spending decisions in present day at time zero. We want to make sure, however, that my cumulative revenues over these 10 years we're going to map, at least exceed the amount that I'm going to spend. Okay, so this is very important to do in the spreadsheet. I don't think I need to show any of you how these formulas go in, in Excel. Okay, so a, a, an example of this actually that I saw recently is I was at a friend's house and we were watching America's Got Talent. And at the end of the show, they had the credits going and I was, I, I, some, for some reason I sometimes read these things. And there was this disclaimer that popped up on the screen very quickly for a few seconds. So I had to actually go Google it after to get the full wording. But basically they say the contestant who wins gets a million dollars. But they say that million dollars the contestant may choose. They've got two options. They can choose to get that as an annuity over 40 years. So in other words, take a million, divide 40 is 25,000. They can choose to receive 25,000 every year for the next 40 years. That's option one. Or you may choose to receive the present cash value of such an annuity. That's how this works on the TV. So what would, which one would you take? If you won, which one would you pick? Which one? Who would pick the present value? Get the money right now, right? <laughs> and while ABC is still around. <laughs> so most people would probably pick the present value. I probably would as well. But the alternative is, yeah, I could receive a paycheck of twenty-five thousand dollars for the rest of my life. But that twenty-five thousand dollars is not going to be the same twenty-five thousand dollars in that fortieth year by the time I receive my last money. It's going to buy me a lot less and have a lot less value to me than. So they were bringing, yeah, that's bringing in a whole different um, aspect to the calculation. If you're going to be taxed on it, it may be more efficient to pro prolong how you receive the money, or you may prefer just to pay a lump sum tax. Well, so again, there's now you're making projections on what tax rates are in the future and what your financial situation is. So, so the time value of money plays plays into into a number of calculations, but most commonly in engineering situations, we're wanting to compare revenues and expenses in present day and right now times zero, but we need to deflate our future revenues to make that fair comparison. Okay. So now the now a little bit of the opposite is the following is if I put money in a bank account, you don't get this too much these days, but 
most savings accounts or, or checking accounts certainly give you low interest, but let's say we do have a bank account or with one of the one of the companies that pay interest, they'll pay you an interest rate and they pay you that dollar value because they're using your money and, and lending it out to other people. So to compensate you for your lack of being able to uh, use the money, they're paying you a very nominal interest rate. So if I give the bank a thousand dollars here at period zero, what we're asking is how much is that thousand dollars going to be worth if I compound it annually at a certain at a certain interest rate the bank is paying. So then the relationship is, is, is very similar. My future balance that I'm going to see in that time period in the future <coughs> is going to be whatever I invested, my principal, plus the interest rate they're paying me compounded on whichever basis, annually or monthly. So you can then ask a question, what is that thousand dollars going to be worth if you deposit it now and, and you get the interest and you compound it annually? You can do a simple calculation then to show that by the 10th year, at 10% interest, it's going to be worth 2,593. So you've accumulated some money over there. But what's also happened during the sustained 10 years? Okay, so there's, it's been taken away from you as well. So you're, the bank has given you some money from the investment, but there's also the deflation and the devaluing of it. So what I'll do is um, leave you with this example that I'd like to take a look at. We'll pick this up next class. If we take a look at the scenario where you've given the bank $5,000 and they're giving you a compound interest rate of I star. But the time value of money is declining by I dash. An interest rate I dash. So we've got I star that's being given to you by the bank and I dash. So calculate the present value of that $5,000 in your account after any years. So do this symbolically and calculate what is that, that five thousand dollars going to be worth and, and, and its accumulative compound interest that's grown on that five thousand dollars, but also take the time value of money into account and calculate for me in a single equation what the present value is.